Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Exotic Astrology. We are back with Lars again, and this is the part three of the video. We have been discussing on time relationships, and he has very beautifully explained using Hellenistic astrology and some other techniques about sun and moon and how they can help in timing, uh, in knowing what kind of people you might attract and importance of Venus and the seventh house. And now uh, I will be asking him some basic questions on this and. Uh, after that we will go to how to exactly time them okay so the first thing i would ask is like suppose you said uh, in a lady's case the planets which are influencing the sun that will decide the kind of you know, men yes suppose suppose there is a, a planet which is retrograde like opposite the sun there is a retrograde jupiter or retrograde saturn or any retrograde planet so does it mean that there can be some instability even if it is a benefit like jupiter yeah i i think so and and that's been that's been my general experience with it uh the thing about the opposition aspect is that um especially with the sun right the sun the the planets are as you said retrograde and so uh the opposition is um of course it's a very powerful powerful aspect so it can make things happen but it can also make things happen in a less stable manner. And one of the general rules in Hellenistic astrology for refining this is that if the benefic planets are in square or opposition, their, their power to bestow the gifts that they offer as benefics is diminished because it's almost like somebody trying to give you a gift, but you're resisting it. So they're trying to give it to you, but you're just like, I don't really want it or I'm not worthy of it or whatever, you know? <laughs> so there's resistance. Um, whereas when they're in sextile or trine or conjunction in certain cases, right, they, they just bestow the gifts freely. There's no resistance. Somebody comes and gives you a gift and it's oh great. Thank you. You know, but the malefics do the opposite where they're in hard aspect and their power to be, oppressive is generally speaking increased so uh saturn in opposition or square is going to be very very oppressive because again it's that same thing of resisting of resisting something and in saturn's case it could work out metaphorically like let's say um let's say we all know people like this i'm sure you know, somebody like fractures their foot okay like they fracture the bone in their foot and then instead of going and getting it checked out at the doctors, like right away and getting a cast, they're like, no, 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 I'm just going to walk it off. <laughs> so they just keep walking on it. And then a week later, it's like 10 times worse than if they had just gone to the doctor immediately. Or, you know, as in the case of Mars, if you're resisting, um, if you're resisting a situation like uh, if you're trying to shave, Okay, and you, you didn't put enough soap on your face or on your legs if you're a lady, you know, and you're trying to shave, right? It doesn't matter how sharp that razor blade is that there's resistance uh, because of your hair. So you're going to cut yourself, <laughs> right? So the malefics are less oppressive when they're in sextile or trine aspects, according to this tradition, because there's not the resistance, right? So, um, you know, we can apply that to those same examples or the one I like uh, the two I like uh, are like if if uh, if you, a drunk driver is very rarely harmed in a car crash when they crash because they're so relaxed. Okay, so there's no there's no resistance. They're not resisting. Their muscles aren't tensing up. They're not moving in a strange way that causes their elbow to like be slammed into the side of the, you know. So they're they're typically not very hurt. And then Mars, you know, if, if it's a well-placed Mars and it's in a benefic aspect, like I just talked about, it's like a sharp scalpel that a surgeon will use. You know, you want the scalpel to be nice and sharp and clean and just cut through that skin nice and evenly. If it was dull or rusty, you're going to get like a really screwed up cut <laughs> and infection and so on. So we, we have these wonderful metaphors that we can come up with to understand how this stuff works in a chart. So Jupiter retrograde opposite the sun um, can indeed be difficult because there's a, there's a natural resistance happening in that opposition and retrograde planets are, they are in one sense more powerful when they're retrograde, but in another sense they're weakened because they're, it's like too much of a good thing. 
So with Jupiter and Venus, right, if you eat too many sweets, you're going to get sick. And maybe you'll get diabetes or something like that, or you'll gain a lot of weight, right? So retrograde is kind of a, a wonky, funky thing for the planets. It can bring more power, but it's usually imbalanced. So yeah, retrograde Jupiter opposite the sun could bring a woman into relationships um, where the person is potentially like a religious zealot or something, like very ideological um, or even possibly like in some cases, maybe even manipulative with money. If, if, you know, if Saturn's also maybe aspecting Jupiter or something like that, you know, there's just, there's a lot of different ways. Or if it was Jupiter, Mars, um, if Mars was aspecting that Jupiter, the person might be like really, really competitive, you know, like, and really kind of like domineering and overly aggressive or something like that. If it was, uh, if it was Venus aspecting that Jupiter, then maybe that person becomes like, um, oh, just overly sexual, you know, just overly extravagantly sexual or, um, or try, or just is obsessed with, um, maybe obsessed with money. Who knows? There's so many different possibilities and it's hard to, it's hard to take it out of context, but I, I actually did, did have a friend who, um, she has that condition of sun opposite Jupiter and she's never been in a relationship for longer than a few months. And, um, she dated a good friend of mine <laughs> and, uh, he, he was, um, he's, in my opinion, he's not necessarily super Jupiterian as a person, but in the context of their relationship, he was very Jupiterian, very Jupiter retrograde actually, because the opposition is very forceful too. So, and so is the square. There's a lot of forcefulness there. So part of why their relationship went sour was because he was always trying to convince her to be more open-minded in terms of religion. And this is very funny because he, he is really into Advaita Vedanta. Like he loves uh, Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, for example, and other yogis like that, that, that have this really like, non-duality kind of message whereas she was christian so um so he would always try to like force his beliefs on her <laughs> about non-duality and vita vedanta <laughs> which is you know the least closed-minded form of of religious thinking if you get down to it it's it's really the least dogmatic but you could still make that dogmatic and so there was this opposition friction over religious belief in their relationships Yes. And what about Rahu Ketu? What have you seen? If Sun is conjunct Rahu. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's tough. That's just really tough for, for everything. Um, you know, a good example is Donald Trump's chart where he has Sun yes. Rahu and he's born during a lunar eclipse. So both of his lights. Um, so his moon, we look at his moon, moon Ketu. Um, you know, he's he's been with, well, he's, you know, he's married to a, a foreign woman which I think could be a very moon K2 or moon Rahu thing. It, it could be either one. Um, he's, you know, he rejects women, which is a very K2 thing. He, he just kind of hates and rejects women in a lot of ways. Right. And, and so K2 can be something that we, we push away or reject or are afraid of depending on the rest of the chart. Um, and, um, and I don't know, I don't know as much about like his former wives and stuff, but there's uh yeah, I think there's a lot, there's probably a lot more that could be said about that, isn't there, you know, but, but to change it up, a, a good friend of mine who I've kind of lost touch with, uh, he has a uh, moon Rahu pretty close in Pisces and he so far hasn't been married, but he's always been in these like really strange tumultuous relationships with women. Like he's, he's kind of taking advantage of women uh, in, in, in a, in a really emotionally unhealthy way. It's like a very emotionally unhealthy way. He, he gets with women that are emotionally scarred in some manner, like really dysfunctional and, and have a lot of emotional problems. And he, um, he also had tried to be like polyamorous at one point, which means that he would be with multiple women at the same time. <laughs> so, that, you know, that's a pretty good like Rahu Moon 
kind of thing. Um, and uh, unfortunately, right now, I can't think of like a Rahu Sun situation for a woman's chart. I don't, nothing's coming to mind, but we could imagine, you know, a, a similar thing as that. Uh, but just on the woman's end, dating really dysfunctional men or being married to really obsessive, controlling men. Um, actually, one person's chart I remember had Sun and Libra it, with K2. And they also had Mars in a sextile aspect from, um, what would that be? From, I think, Sagittarius. Yeah, that, that, that would be it, Sagittarius. So, so that was the only planet making a major close Tajika aspect, the sextile there. And this person's husband was, I think, um, I think he was in the military, so very Mars thing, but he was also like belligerent and angry and abusive. But, but he like never had, it seemed like he never had actually hit her but he would just yell at her a lot. And it's almost like just maybe having like the weak son, really weak Libra K2 thing. Maybe he just was a coward. And um, I mean, people who beat their spouses are cowards anyway, but I just mean he was like doubly a coward. Like he couldn't even actually hit the person. He just, he could only yell or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh boy. So yeah, yeah that's um, no, but that's a really good question. Yeah. Yes, so maybe now some techniques or by which we can time. Yeah, great. Let's talk about that. So um, kind of the most basic couple of techniques are for timing this kind of stuff are um, something called annual perfections, which is similar to Sudarshana Chakra from Parashara, where uh, the ascendant sun and moon each move one sign per year and change signs. But we we typically focus more on the ascendant um, and sometimes the moon and sun as well. But if we just start with the ascendant, um, one possibility is when the perfection perfected ascendant comes to the sign where the seventh lord is, the sign where Venus is, this or the signs either co-owned by Venus or co-owned by the seventh lord. You know, you want to focus more on the seventh Lord, I think, than Venus, um, because it's more individualized for that person in particular, right? Everybody might have Venus in a particular sign for 30 days or whatever. So focusing a bit more on, on stuff related to the ascendant. And then, of course, the seventh house, if it comes to the seventh house. So and it's 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 a, it's a cycle of 12 years. So it'll come to the seventh house um, like at age six. Yes at age uh, 18, 19. right, and so on. Yeah, the 18th year or the sixth year and, and that kind of a thing because the first year of your life is zero to one. So um, so it's a very nice, simple technique. And, you know, you want to basically, you have to assess, you have to assess like which planets are strong enough to give the relationship in the first case. So is the seventh Lord going to give the relationship? Is Venus going to give the relationship? Um, is the planet aspecting the sun or the moon going to give it? Or do you look at the place where the lot is, meaning the, um, the Saham dealing with marriage? And we have a few different ones in Hellenistic astrology, but the main one I use is calculated like this. For, for men, you take the distance from starting with Saturn to Venus. You take that exact distance by degree and then you add that to the ascendant okay. okay so you add that to the ascendant and then whatever sign it falls in and degree and so on and then for women it's just the reverse you take venus to saturn and i like to use this one because it logically shows some a mar it, it shows marriage because of venus that's going to last a long time saturn right durability and longevity and responsibility too so this is going to show like more marriage as like something that happens concretely. Whereas we have some other lots that are taken from like Jupiter, Venus that can show happiness and abundance from marriage, or we have ones that can show like more of the sexual side of the marriage and things like that. But I just, I typically stick to this one for, for mo my, my major things on marriage. And again, with the Sahams, you want to just check, you want to check everything out. Like it's a planet. What house does it fall in? Is it in a good house? 
is the sign it falls in um, relatively auspicious when it comes to marriage, right? So Libra, Taurus, definitely. Um, the Mars signs, yes, but but it's more of like a visceral attraction or something, you know, um, and, and, and that kind of general guideline. But then more, much more importantly is what planets are aspecting it, again, by Tajika style aspects, and what is its Lord doing? Is its Lord in good condition? And so when the perfections come to that lot or the Lord of that lot, uh, a.k.a. the Saham, the lot, right, then that can also be a potential time the person will get married. Well, okay, so I've just thrown out like <laughs> tons of possible things of, that can mean the person's getting married. How, so how do you choose which one it's going to be? That's where you have to take in other Dashas or Time Lord systems. So for the Tajik, per the Tajika methods, you want to use the Varsha Fall or Solar Return method. You know, that's very powerful to use with perfections. And that is a whole another, I mean, that's a, that's a really long explanation. But the simplest way to do it is to cast the Varsha fall chart and let's say let's say the um let's say the person's uh chart came to their 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 perfections um of the ascendant came to the lord of the seventh house in the chart let's just say that for argument's sake so you think okay so it's possible that seventh house things are going to happen this year for the person so let's see if a relationship or marriage is possible then what you'd want to do is, um, you know, see see how the, well, you know, you just analyze the chart normally. Like, is the is the seventh lord also associated with Venus? Is the seventh lord associated with a benefic that can help it, like Jupiter? Is the seventh lord associated, is it its lord in the seventh house or with Venus? Stuff like that, right? So then you look at the solar return chart and you want to see if, the, the Saham for marriage from that chart first is emphasized and it's going to be emphasized if it's like right on the ascendant or right on the midheaven or right on the seventh house or something like that, right? Like right, right in that house and it's Lord is strong and it's getting good aspects and stuff like that. And then there's a lot of fine tuning that goes on with Varsha fall. Like you have to look and see, for example, even if marriage or relationship were a possibility that year, you'd want to see if like the moon or the ascendant lord or some other important factor signifying the person is also making a close aspect with those factors, you know, the lot of marriage or the seventh lord in that chart. So that's kind of getting a little complex, but that's that would be sort of the one of the things that Persian astrologers would do. But you can also start, again, go back, going back more simply, you can look at the perfections and then you can look at a time lord like you could use Vimshotri Dasha, right? And you could see for Vimshotri Dasha if, let's say, we're looking at a woman's chart and we have like Jupiter aspecting her son with a good aspect and they're in decent condition or whatever. So then you might say, oh, well, maybe during sun Jupiter Dasha, they could meet that person. Or marry that person, but if you're going to term, if you're going to determine if it's a marriage or a meeting, of course you got to look at other factors. You know, maybe they meet them during Jupiter Sun, but maybe they don't marry them until, um, or sorry, Sun Jupiter. Maybe they don't marry them until Sun, um, Sun Rahu. Or let's let's skip ahead actually, because Rahu is is um, oh no, Rahu comes before Jupiter. Sorry, uh, Sun Saturn. Sun Saturn. Yeah, so maybe they get married during Sun Saturn to Shah, and you might be wondering, well, but why would they get married? And you look at the birth chart closely and you find, oh, well, Saturn is the lord of the lot of marriage, or Saturn is sitting with the lot of marriage in Libra, you know, so exalted planet helping that lot of marriage, or something like this, you know, Saturn is linked some way to the marriage. And if you, if you also find at the same time, using like perfections and transits and any other techniques that marriage things are getting emphasized, you start to like, you start to build on that. And what happens is something called confluence where you're using like maybe five to 10 different techniques for prediction. And they're all pointing towards this same thing that we're calling marriage or relationship. And so 
that's kind of how you can do it. Um, there are other techniques in Hellenistic astrology, like uh, something called triplicity lords, for example. And that's uh, a little complex for me to go into in this video, but like if you use the triplicity lord method, again, you can get a general period of time when the person would be likely to get married based upon the triplicity lords of Venus or the lot of marriage or the seventh house, or maybe all of them, if you look at all of them. And then you're comparing that to perfections. You're comparing that to Vimshotri Desha. If you're using um, more Indian methods, you might use the natural age Desha, right? I think that's called um, Naisarga Desha or something like that, right? Yeah, and we have... Naisargik Desha. Naisargik Desha, yeah. And we have, a, we have a similar method from Ptolemy, again, called the Ages of Man. It's the same idea, but it's a different order of planets. And so for everyone's life, you know, the moon rules the first few years, and then Mercury, and then Venus, and then Sun, and so on. And so when you start stacking these all up together, you'll find a place where they all converge, like a year, let's say. And then you'll be able to deduce when the marriage will occur. So you go from the general which I described in the other videos to the specific using these techniques. And, you know, there are many more dashas or time Lord techniques in Hellenistic that can be employed. And same with um, Jyotish, right? There's like, there's like 40 or 50 different time Lords. And we, we usually stick to just a couple of them, but Jaimini gives like 12 different ones and at least right. And, and Parashara himself gives like, five or six or more. And um, so the more they kind of converge, the more chances you have of, of getting it right. And then there's a very powerful technique uh, that, that I'm not super, I'm not super good with it, but I've used it. Uh, it's called primary directions and it's based upon the rotation of the earth. So you're calculating how the planets move through the sky um, on their daily arc through the sky like rising and setting and then you're turning that into a timing technique and so one thing that uh, a later astrologer from England said William Lilly he said that for women's charts you could or no sorry, sorry for for men's charts for marrying a woman you could look and see when the moon was directed to the midheaven or the ascendant which is again hard to explain, but it's just basically like if, if let's say like the moon was in like the, you know, um, like the twelfth house or something, or or no no let's let's do the uh, let's do the eleventh house is a little closer, and let's say the mid heaven is like twenty eight thirty degrees from the moon, then the moon is going to follow the arc of the the rotation of the sky or the earth, and then eventually it'll be brought to that mid heaven about 28, 30, 32 years, because it's not exact one degree per, um, you know, per year, but it's, it's, it's roughly that. So that could be a sign. And, and then you do the same, you can do the same thing for, for a woman's chart too, if the sun is primary directed to an angle, um, or to, again, Venus as well, of course, is always gonna, and it's just, it's just looking at all these factors and seeing how, how they all converge. And when you get like, you know, when you get three, four hits of, of different systems, that's when you're going to have something happen. So <laughs> I hope that was helpful. That's kind of complicated, I know. But, but there's, no, there's no easy, easy, easy way to do this unless you are, you know, have a super powerful intuition and, and you know, you've got, you're like a seer or something. <laughs> so ultimately, it boils down to the same it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not too much different from uh, Jyotish, you know, like Hellenistic and Jyotish are extraordinarily similar in their basic rationale, which is really cool. Yes. Amazing, fantastic. I mean, <laughs> these are things which I've never heard and I'm very sure whoever is watching this video, they've also never heard. I mean, unless they are from your channel or any other place. Cool. Yeah. Well, I haven't talked about this particular subject on my channel yet. So yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs>
nice thank you very much for your time and whoever wants to visit his channel please go you'll find it in the description and if you have not watched part one and part two then also watch it and if you want a reading you can also go to his website you will find that also in the description and see you soon with some other topic <laughs> okay thanks man i really enjoyed this yes okay thank you for coming bye